Good evening. Hope you're all staying safe. Uh, also hope that you're enjoying uh, fall migration as it's taking place right now. So this presentation will give you an idea of not only what kind of birds migrate through Florida in the fall, but what kind of birds migrate through Florida throughout the year. So I'm going to be talking about seasonal migration. And seasonal migration is a predictable seasonal movement of birds between their breeding and wintering grounds. So right now during fall migration, birds are moving south from their breeding grounds and they're heading to their wintering grounds. In the spring, the reverse will happen, that they'll come back from their wintering grounds and head to their breeding grounds, maybe here in Florida or possibly uh, someplace farther north. So some of the questions that I hope to answer uh, as part of this presentation, in the first half of the presentation, I'll be um, letting you know which birds seasonally migrate to South Florida. You may be amazed at how many birds actually migrate through Florida. I'll also let you know when they migrate because they don't all migrate at the same time. In the second part of my presentation, I'll answer questions like, why do these birds even migrate? Why don't they just stay in one place? There are reasons for that. What triggers their migration? How do they know when it's time to migrate? How far do they migrate? How do the migrants navigate? How do they know which direction to go? What hazards do these migrants face? You'll see that there are lots of hazards, both natural hazards and hazards that we're responsible for. And finally, I'll give you some tips for how you can help migratory birds. I need to explain, I need to make sure that everyone understands what I mean by South Florida. Since this presentation is called Bird Migration in South Florida, uh, I need to define what I mean by South Florida. And by South Florida, I mean all of the counties that are south of Lake Okeechobee. So there are seven counties that are either totally or partly south of Lake Okeechobee. And those are Palm Beach County, Broward County, Miami-Dade County, Monroe County, which includes the Dry Tortugas, which is that archipelago that's uh, 68 miles west of Key West, if you've never been there, then Collier County and Lee County on the west coast, and Hendry County, right below Lake Okeechobee. So everything about what I'm going to explain in this presentation is just going to focus on what happens in these seven counties. If I did a presentation on bird migration in all of Florida, it would not be exactly the same as how I'm going to focus this presentation today. Same way if I only did a presentation on bird migration in say Miami-Dade County, it would be slightly different. So keep that in mind as you're viewing this presentation. My starting point for creating this presentation was the Checklist of South Florida Birds, which is a publication of Tropical Audubon Society. Uh, the last version of that checklist was published in 2014 and it lists 442 species. Now in the six years since that checklist was published, a few new birds have been added to South Florida's bird checklist. Um, Red-legged thrush, uh, variegated flycatcher, and today there was a bird that if the identification of the bird is confirmed, uh, will be the first hermit warbler for not only South Florida, but for all of Florida. That bird was discovered this afternoon in Palm Beach County in Spanish River Park. And I'm sure people right now are looking at the photos of that bird to determine whether or not it is in fact a hermit warbler, which as I just said, would be a new bird for Florida. So what I did with the checklist to try to figure out which of the 442 species that are listed in the checklist 
are actually birds that migrate through Florida, I had to kind of separate uh, all the birds on the checklist into six categories. So the six categories that I came up with are birds that are resident birds, like a northern cardinal, birds that are here year round. Second category were summer breeders, like the swallowtail kite. So these are birds that uh, are only here part of the year. They breed here, but they're not here during the winter time. Third category are winter visitors, like these blue winged teal. These are birds that don't spend the summer here. They are here generally just from the fall to the spring. Next category is transients. These are the kind of birds that people think of when they think of spring or fall migration because these are the birds that are only passing through Florida during the spring or during the fall. They usually are not here in the summertime and they're not here in the wintertime. The fifth category are vagrant birds. These are birds that show up in Florida accidentally, like this banana quick which is a bird from the Caribbean, from the Bahamas, Cuba, and many of the other islands in the Caribbean, and also from Central and South America. And they only show up irregularly. So birds from the Caribbean, birds from the Western United States, even birds from Central and South America have shown up in South Florida accidentally. The final category are the introduced birds, like this monk parakeet. So all of the different parrots and bobles and minas and uh, birds that are not native to South Florida that have been introduced here. So for each species on the list, I put them into one of these six categories. And as you're going to see, it's not always easy to figure out exactly which category each bird belongs to. But I decided on a category for each of the 442 species that are in the list. And then I came up with percentages. So the resident species represent about 23% of the total number of birds that have been seen in South Florida. The summer breeders only represent 4%. The winter visitors represent 24%. The transients, 15%. The vagrants, amazingly, represent 28% of all the birds on the list. That's a higher percentage than any of the other categories. So uh, birders that like to chase rare birds, they like it that Florida has lots and lots of vagrants. And then those introduced species only represent about 6% of the birds. So that was my first step. And now my second step was, which of these six categories represent birds that are actually migrants for the purpose of this presentation? So to answer that question, I had to come up with a definition for what I mean by a South Florida migrant bird. And my definition, is any bird can be considered a South Florida migrant bird if it spends part of each year in South Florida and part of each year somewhere else. So I can immediately eliminate the introduced species from this category of South Florida migrants. With the exception of European starling, which in the wintertime, some European starlings will migrate south into South Florida to uh, augment the population of starlings that are already here. Other than that species, all the other introduced species in South Florida are here year round. They don't migrate. I also can eliminate the category of vagrants. Even though vagrant birds had to migrate to get to South Florida, I have to eliminate them because they don't necessarily do that every year. With vagrants, it's more random. They can show up this year and then maybe they won't show up again for another five or 10 years or maybe never. So the vagrants simply don't 
fit into my definition of what I think a South Florida migrant bird is. So that leaves us with four categories that I believe do represent South Florida migrant birds. The summer breeders. Those are the birds that arrive in spring. They breed here, or maybe they pass through South Florida and breed elsewhere in Florida or maybe elsewhere in North America. And then eventually they leave in the fall or again, pass through South Florida during uh, fall migration. And they're not usually present during the winter. Notice that I use the word not usually present. So that means there may be exceptions that for most of these summer breeders, you won't see them in the winter time. But there are a few species where occasionally some individuals of that species will stay for the winter. And I'll let you know when we go through um, the list of the different summer breeders. Next category of South Florida migrants are the winter visitors. Those are the birds that typically arrive in the fall, they leave in the spring, and they're not usually present during the summer. Again, I use the phrase not usually present, so there may be exceptions. The third category of transients. These are the classic migrant birds. These are the birds that pass through South Florida during the spring and or the fall, but they're not usually present during summer or winter. Again, there may be exceptions. The final category are the resident birds. Now you may be surprised by that. If it's a resident bird, aren't those birds here year round? For some resident species, Lots of individuals spend the entire year in South Florida. But for some resident species like this turkey vulture, the population is augmented seasonally. When turkey vultures from the north come down to South Florida to spend the winter. So those could be considered snowbirds. So the population of turkey vultures expands actually quite dramatically in the wintertime as birds from the north that are not resident to South Florida come to South Florida spend the winter. With other resident species, the population change may not be due to necessarily the migration, but it may be due to other reasons like post-breeding dispersal. After a breeding season, the young birds may decide to move to another area, and people will notice that movement, uh, but it's not really a migration, it's more just a dispersal of young birds uh, after they're born. So let's uh, go through each of these four categories one at a time. We'll start with the summer breeders. Again, these are birds that pass through uh, starting in the spring. They may breed here or they may breed further north, they'll start moving south in the fall, and none of them will stay for the winter. So for each of these uh, species that I list, I'm going to tell you what month they typically arrive in South Florida and what month they typically leave. So for swallowtail kites, they typically arrive, the first swallowtail kites, begin arriving in South Florida sometime in February, mid to late February. Some will stay here to breed, but others will continue north to the rest of their breeding uh, range, which is throughout um, the rest of southeastern, um, the southeastern United States. Then in the summertime, after they're finished breeding, the first swallowtail kites will begin migrating back south to their wintering grounds in Central and South America. So some of the birds, the swallowtail kites that have bred here in South Florida, they'll be probably the first to start heading back to their wintering grounds. And the last ones to pass through, which is usually sometime this month, sometime in September, the last of the swallowtail kites they're probably bred at the northern reaches of their 
breeding grounds or breeding range in the southeastern United States, they'll be the last ones to pass through. So October to January, if you're looking for a swallowtail kite in South Florida, you're very, very unlikely to see one because they're simply not here at that time of the year. Same thing with the yellow-billed cuckoos. They typically ar arrive in March and they leave in October. They typically breed in the interior of South Florida, but they also breed in Key Largo, but they're generally not here in the wintertime. Though there have been a few uh, reports of yellow-billed cuckoos in the winter, but they may be just late migrants. Time will tell if they'll start wintering here. This is common nighthawk. They typically arrive in April and they leave by October and they can be found throughout South Florida. The very similar Antillian nighthawk, which is a, a Caribbean species, only breeds in the Florida Keys and they're here from April to August. The only way to tell a common nighthawk from an Antillian nighthawk, or the only uh, way for most people to tell uh, a common nighthawk from an Antillian nighthawk is by their vocalizations, which are distinctly different. This is a Chuck Wills widow, a number, another summer breeder. They breed mostly in pinelands, like in Everglades National Park. They're here from March to October, but some are known to winter here. This is a chimney swift. This is a rather recent uh, um, addition to the list of summer breeders in South Florida. Um, they typically breed in urban areas and literally they will breed in chimneys. So if you've ever been to uh, places in uh, Miami that have houses with chimneys like in Pinecrest or Coral Gables, uh, that's where chimney swifts are likely breeding. We have lots of several different species of terns that are summer breeders in South Florida. This is a uh, least tern, which uh, breeds on beaches, uh, mostly on the west coast of South Florida, though this year with the closing of beaches due to the pandemic, um, there was a breeding colony of least terns that uh, formed in Hillsborough Beach in Broward County. And that was the first time in recent memory that um, least terns bred uh, on a beach on the Atlantic coast in South Florida. Lease terns also will breed on rooftops. Uh, they've adapted to um, being able to breed in a place where their chicks are not likely to um, be eaten by predators. And I'll talk about what happened to some of the chicks that were born on Hillsborough Beach later in this presentation. But lease terns are typically here only from April to September. If you want to see this bird, this is a sooty tern, you have to go to the dry tortugas. This is a bird that uh, only breeds, the only place in North America where it breeds is in the dry tortugas, and they're there from February to September. Same thing with this tern. This is called, called a brown knotty. And like the sooty tern, they're also there in the dry tortugas from February to September. Same thing with this bird. This is a bridal tern. It's in the tortugas from April to September. The roseate tern breeds just in the Florida Keys. That's the only place in South Florida where they breed. They also breed as far north as New England. And they're here from April to August. And these are gull bill terns, which the only place that I'm aware of where they breed is around Lake Okeechobee. And they're here from April to September, though some do winter, especially in uh, Florida Bay. This is a great kingbird. This is another Caribbean species that's here from March to October and they prefer breeding in urban areas. They'll even breed in, in shopping centers. So uh, they'll be leaving shortly and they won't be here in the winter. Occasionally uh, they're reported in the winter, but not very often. This is an Eastern Kingbird. This bird breeds in the Everglades and Big Cypress and also throughout much of North America. They're in South Florida just from March to October. 
I don't believe there's ever been a winter record of this bird. This is a red-eyed vireo. They're here from March to October. They breed in the inland areas as well, not in the urban areas. So you can find them, especially in uh, Big Cypress National Preserve. I don't believe they breed in the Everglades that I'm aware of. This is the uh, uh, vireo that's very similar to red-eyed vireo. This is black-whiskered vireo. And like the gray kingbird, this is a Caribbean species. And most black-whiskered vireos in South Florida breed in the Florida Keys. They do breed a little bit in Miami-Dade and possibly in Collier County, but most breed in the Keys. These are purple martins. They're a very, they're a summer breeder, but they arrive as early as January. And they now rely almost exclusively on man-made structures for nesting, gourds, houses, things like that. So a lot of people in South Florida, South Florida will erect uh, structures for them to build their nests um, and then wait for them to start arriving begin, beginning in January. This is a cave swallow. This is the Caribbean subspecies of cave swallow, which uh, uh, 20 or 30 years ago, I guess, began nesting under bridges, especially here in Miami-Dade County. So they're typically here from January to September, but some of them will winter. This beautiful bird is the prothonotary warbler, and they're here from March to October. If you want to see these during the breeding season, you have to go into Big Cypress National Preserve or places like Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. And then we also see them during migration. Birds that nest farther north are passing through South Florida right now. And we've been seeing them in local parks. Now come some examples of birds that don't quite fit into one category. This is a ruby-throated hummingbird. It's a summer breeder, but as many of you know, many ruby-throated hummingbirds that breed farther north come to South Florida for the winter. So I could call a ruby-throated hummingbird a resident bird, but the problem is that I'm not sure if the birds that breed here and ruby-throated hummingbirds only breed in Collier and Lee counties in South Florida. I'm not sure if those birds stay the entire year or if they migrate south because ruby-throated hummingbirds will migrate all the way to Central America. They migrate to Cuba during the winter. So because I'm not sure what happens to our breeding ruby-throated hummingbirds, I kind of put them into two categories. I consider them summer breeders, but I also consider them winter visitors. So if you want to see a ruby-throated hummingbird during the breeding season, you have to go to Collier or Lee counties, and you have to do so from May to August. If you want to see a visiting ruby-throated hummingbird, much easier. They're found in all of the counties in South Florida, and they usually start arriving in September, and then the last ones will head back north again in April. Here are some other examples of birds that, are, that I consider both summer breeders and winter visitors. This is great crested flycatcher. The breeders are here from April to August, the visitors from September to March. This is a blue-gray gnatcatcher, very common bird in the wintertime, but they do breed in the interior of Florida. They breed from April to July, and the visitors are here as early as July, and then the last ones will head north in March. This is a northern perula, breeding in the interior from March to August, the visitors everywhere from August to April. This is a common yellowthroat. The breeders in the interior in sawgrass marshes from April to August, the visitors everywhere from September to June. This is a pine warbler. Again, maybe the pine warblers that breed in the pinelands in places like Long Pine Key and Everglades National Park, maybe they stay the whole year, 
or maybe those migrate further south. They are known from several of the islands in the Caribbean. So that's why I've put them in this category as summer breeders slash winter visitors. The breeders are here from March to August and the visitors from September to April. Here are some more examples of birds that are summer breeders and winter visitors. But for these three species, the differences between summer breeders and winter visitors depend on the sub subspecies. So this is a willet. This is the eastern subspecies of willet, the subspecies semipalmatus, which breeds in small numbers in the Keys and on the west coast of South Florida. So they're here from April to July. Much more common is the western subspecies of willet, subspecies inornata, which starts arriving in South Florida in July, and the last of them leave by May. So some people consider these two subspecies of willets to actually be separate species. So if they ever split willet into eastern willet and western willet, we're going to have to learn how to tell them apart. So the photograph that I have of eastern willet shows what a willet looks like in its breeding plumage. For the western willet, it shows what it looks like in its non-breeding or winter plumage. A couple of uh, other examples of uh, summer breeders, winter visitors that are split by subspecies. Prairie warbler. Many people may not realize this, but prairie warblers actually breed in Florida. The breeding subspecies is Paludicola, which is here from April to August. And for some of the Florida subspecies of prairie warblers, they may spend the whole year here. They may uh, be resident here. The more familiar prairie warbler is the dominant race, the ra uh, subspecies Discala, which is uh, here from July to April. So these are the prairie warblers that we typically see uh, during migration in local parks or maybe even in your backyard. This is a yellow warbler. There is a race or subspecies of yellow warbler called the golden, sometimes called the Cuban race of uh, yellow warbler, uh, subspecies Gunlachi, which uh, just like the Florida subspecies of prairie warbler uh, is here from April to August, though some may be here the, the whole year. So those breed like the prairie warbler, the uh, Florida race of prairie warbler, the golden race of yellow warbler, if you wanna see those, you have to go to mangroves because that's their breeding habitat. But if you wanna see the North American races of yellow warbler that migrate through South Florida from July to May, uh, you can see those anywhere. They're not common, but uh, they show up in parks and in the Everglades, and there are actually three different subspecies that pass through uh, South Florida at different, possibly at different times of the year. And they're very, very difficult to distinguish one from the other. So those are the summer breeders and winter visitors by subspecies. There are a few uh, birds that are here in the summer, but they don't breed here. And most of those are um, pelagic birds, birds that you have to go out in a boat to see. So this is an Audubon shearwater. They're um, offshore here in South Florida, typically from April to August. This is a quarry shearwater, also, uh, also arriving in April, but may stay as late as November. And occasionally they're reported in the wintertime. This is a uh, Wilson storm petrel. Uh, again, only appears offshore, typically here from April to August. This is a brown booby. They're found uh, mostly offshore in the Keys. Um, if you go to a lot of the um, old lighthouses, uh, starting with Fowey Light uh, off of Key Biscayne, and all of the lighthouses that are strung through the Florida Keys, and then also in the dry tortugas, you can see brown boobies that like to perch 
on uh, those lighthouses or on different buoys. They're typically here from April to September, though again, some of them may, may winter. So there are some birds that are here in the summer that may not necessarily breed, and these are mostly seabirds. All right, let's move on to winter visitors. So ducks are a classic example of winter visitors. I've already told you about, about blue-winged teal. They typically start arriving in um, South Florida in August. Remember that these winter visitors don't breed here. They're only here from the fall through the spring. So blue-winged teal may arrive as early as August, and the last ones may not leave until May. This is green-winged teal, here from November to March. Northern shoveler, here from September to April. American widgeon, here from October to April. Um, this is northern pintail, here from October to April. And this is gadwall, here from November to February. For each of these birds, I'm uh, showing you uh, both the males and the females. For many ducks, they exhibit sexual dimorphism. So the males are typically more brightly colored than the females. Uh, I won't be able to do that with all of the birds that exhibit sexual dimorphism, but I do so for the ducks. So more ducks, redheads, here from November to March. This is canvasback, also here from November to March. This is lesser scot. November to April. This is ringneck duck, October to March. Black scoters, which you typically have to see offshore from November to March. This beautiful duck is hooded merganser here from November to March. These are red-breasted mergansers, which are typically a saltwater bird here from November to May. And these are ruddy ducks here from October to March. Some more winter visitors. This is common loon. This is in its winter plumage. This is uh, horn grebe, also in its winter plumage. Northern gannet, another bird that you uh, passes through South Florida offshore, though oftentimes when the winds are blowing right, you can see these birds from shore. These are American white pelicans. They're typically here from September to April, but some of the young birds won't go to their breeding grounds during the summer, and they'll even they'll stay here in South Florida during the summer. This is American bittern. This is the only wading bird that is uh, just a winter visitor. Every other wading bird that you'll see in South Florida is a resident species. They breed here, except for this one, the American bittern. You can see them typically from October to March. More winter visitors. This is the American coot, a type of rail, here from September to May, though some summer and a few of them even breed here. This is Sora, another rail, here from September to May. I saw my first one today. This is Virginia rail, here from November to April. The very rare black rail is here typically from December to May, though some may summer and be here all year. The even rarer yellow rail is here from October to May. I've yet to see one of these in South Florida. Lots of shorebirds are winter visitors, so I'll show you these in their winter plumage. This is black-bellied plover. So during the winter, a black-bellied plover doesn't have a black belly. It's here from July to May. This is a semi-palmated plover here from July to April. This is a piping plover, which is an endangered species, here from August to April. So you can see these birds on the beach. Same thing with sandaling, here from July to May. This is a red knot, here from August to May. Ruddy turnstone, also August to May. This is a uh, greater yellow legs, which is here from July to May. Like, sorry, this is a lesser yellow legs. And the this second one, that's the greater yellow legs. Greater yellow legs has a longer bill than a lesser yellow legs. This is a leaf sandpiper here from July to April. This is a spotted sandpiper in winter plumage, no spots, here from August to April. This is a western sandpiper, August to April. And this is a dunlin here from September to May. 
more shorebirds, some beautiful shorebirds. This is American Avocet, September to April. Marble Godwit, August to April. Wimbrel, September to April. Stilt Sandpiper, July to May. This is short bill Dowager, here from August to May. And long bill Dowager, here from September to April. Finishing off with the shorebirds, this is a Wilson snipe. They're here from October to April. And this is a, a very rare bird in South Florida. This is the American woodcock, but you can find them uh, in the Everglades during the winter from November to February. This is a red phalarope, which uh, is a type of shorebird, but most red phalaropes that come to Florida, you have to go offshore to see them from August to April. This is a Jaeger. Again, you have to go offshore to see Jaegers. This is Palmer and Jaeger here from September to April. And this is Parasitic Jaeger, which is here from October to April. Lots of gulls come to South Florida during the winter time. We have our laughing gulls year round, but in the winter you can see Bonaparte's gull from November to April. You can see ringbill gulls from September to April. Herring gulls from October to April, lesser blackback gulls from September to April, though some will summer. Great blackback gull, which is the largest gull in the world, they're here from November to February. And then one tern, Forster's tern, is here only from September to April. Lots of raptors, birds of prey come here during winter. This is Northern Harrier here from September to April. This is um, Sharp Shin Hawk, September to May. Broadway Hawk, also September to May. Swainson's Hawk from October to February. Falcons are here in the winter. Kestrels, American Kestrel from September to May. Merlins from September to May. Peregrine Falcons from September to May. And then we also have an owl that's a winter visitor. This is Shorty and Owl which will show up from November to March. Some night jars that are winter visitors. This is Whippoorwill here from September to April. Lesser Nighthawk, a somewhat rare night jar in South Florida, but they're here from November, November to February. Belted Kingfishers are not resident in South Florida. They're only here from August to April, so they're considered a winter visitor. Yellow-bellied sapsucker is the only member of the woodpecker family in South Florida that's not a resident. It's here from October to April. Flycatchers like Eastern Phoebes are here from October to March. This is a least flycatcher. I saw my first one today. These are here from September to April. And this is brown-crested flycatcher, which uh, is found here from November to May. Some more flycatchers. This is Western Kingbird, here from October to April. Tropical Kingbird, which uh, is from Central and South America. And they started, they started as a vagrant, and now they're showing up pretty much every year. So now I consider them a true winter visitor. And they're typically here from September to May. And this beautiful bird is a scissor tail flycatcher. And you can see those from October to April. We have some winter visitor vireos. This is yellow-throated vireo here from August to April, and blue-headed vireo here from October to April. This is Bell's vireo, which not very, very common in South Florida, but when they do show up, it's typically between September and April. Swallows are winter visitors. This is tree swallow, September to April. Northern Roughwing Swallow from August to April. This is a Ruby Crown Kinglet. You can see these starting in October and possibly until April. Not common, but uh, they do show up in winter. Some wrens are winter visitors. This is House Wren here from August, uh, October to April. This is Marsh Wren here from September to May. And Sedge Wren, which is here from October to March. This is American Pippet. This is a bird that we're not seeing as often in South Florida, but when they do show up, it's typically between November and February. This beautiful bird is a cedar waxwing, and they're here 
typically from October to as late as May, depending upon if uh, ficus trees are still in fruit and uh, providing food for them. They like eating berries. Gray cat bird, very common bird here in the wintertime. They typically start arriving in October and leave in April. This is a thrush, this is a hermit thrush. And they're a winter visitor. We have thrushes that are just transients. You'll see those in a few minutes. Uh, but the hermit thrush is typically here just from October to April, and they do winter here in small numbers. American robins will winter here. Some years there are just thousands of them, other years maybe only a few. So they're typically here from November to March. And this is an American goldfinch. Again, some years lots of them, other years not so many, here from November to April. Sparrows become very common here during the wintertime. This is a savanna sparrow. This is a chipping sparrow. This is a clay-colored sparrow, a grasshopper sparrow, a swamp sparrow, and a white crown sparrow. So these are just here in the wintertime. We don't have any sparrows that breed here other than house sparrows, which are in a completely different family. That's an introduced species. A few other sparrows. This is Lincoln sparrow. This is Nelson sparrow, which has a very restricted winter range. Same thing with salt marsh sparrow. And this is lark sparrow, which um, doesn't show up often, but very beautiful sparrow. Warblers, lots of warblers winter here. More warblers winter in South Florida than anywhere else in the United States. So oven birds are winter visitors. Now, they start coming through Florida as early as August, but some of them will winter, others will continue migrating further south to the Caribbean or maybe to Central or South America. Um, they'll pass through again during the spring and the last oven birds we'll see in the spring typically pass through uh, sometime in May. Northern water thrushes here from August to May. Palm warblers, one of the most common warblers in the winter, are here from October to April, though I saw my first one today. Black and white warblers are winter visitors, as are yellow-throated warblers. These two are among the first to arrive during the fall. They typically arrive as early as late July. Same thing with American red stars. They start arriving in August and be, many of them will be here all winter and the last of them will pass through in May. Black-throated blue warbler, worm-eating warbler, Cape May warbler, winters here in small numbers. Magnolia warbler is now wintering in South Florida, as is black-throated green warbler. The yellow rump warbler is extremely common here. Orange crown warbler, kind of hard to identify for some people, but they're here during the wintertime. Nashville warbler, a few are here in the wintertime. Some are seen just during migration. Same thing with Wilson's warbler. A few will stay here for the winter. This is a yellow-breasted chat. Uh, it used to be a member of the warbler family, but now it's in its own family. And they're here in the wintertime. The beautiful painted bunting doesn't breed here. It's only here as a winter visitor. Typically starts to arrive in September. The last of them leave in April. Its cousin, the indigo bunting, is here from August to May, and they will winter. Summer tanagers will actually winter in South Florida. That was not always the case. We see them more often as migrants, but some will winter here. So they, you can see them here from September to April. Baltimore Orioles are winter visitors, as are yellow-headed blackbirds. That's, this is a species that I used to consider a vagrant, but now they're so regular, uh, they're not uh, predictable, but uh, in some places they are. But I now consider this to be uh, more of a winter visitor than uh, a, a, my, a um, vagrant bird. Okay, let's get into the transient birds. These are the birds that are only here during spring and fall migration. So they have very narrow windows for 
uh, people in South Florida see, to see them. This is a shorebird. This is upland sandpiper. It passes through in April and May. The easiest time to see them, though, is generally from July to September. This is a semi-palmated sandpiper. They're here from April to June, and then again from July to October. White rump sandpipers here in spring, again in the fall. This is a buff-breasted sandpiper, not very common. Uh, can be considered a rare bird, but they do pass through Florida and uh, South Florida in small numbers, both in the spring and the fall. This is a pectoral sandpiper. And this is a solitary sandpiper. So all of these are transient shorebirds. More shorebirds. This is a Wilson's phalarope. This is a redneck phalarope. Some terns are just transients. This is a common tern. This is an Arctic tern, which actually passes along the coast in South Florida, just in the spring, typically from April to June. And this is a black tern, which passes through in small numbers in the spring and larger numbers in the fall. This is a Mississippi kite. It's just a transient in South Florida, as is black bill cuckoo just a transient. Barn swallows are probably the most common transient species that passes through South Florida. They'll pass through from March to April, and again in very large numbers from July to November, and some summer, and a few have even been known to breed in some locations in South Florida, typically around Lake Okeechobee. This is a cliff swallow, which is a transient swallow, as is the bank swallow, a transient swallow. This is an olive-sided flycatcher. We just had one of these in Miami-Dade. Uh, it's a very rare transient, but they do pass through South Florida in small numbers, both in the spring and the fall. This is uh, Eastern Wood Peewee, which is another transient flycatcher. This is a, a Pitonax flycatcher called a yellow-bellied flycatcher. And they pass through in small numbers, um, both in spring and fall, as does Acadian flycatcher. Alder flycatcher, typically we only see those in the fall. Willow flycatcher is probably the rarest of the Epidonex flycatchers to pass through. And they typically only pass through in the fall that we know of. Some transient thrushes. Remember that I mentioned that there will be several thrushes that are just passing through in spring and fall. This thrush is called a veery. This is a wood thrush. This is a Swainson's thrush, a gray cheek thrush, and the very rare Bicknell's thrush all pass through South Florida as transients, as do a couple of vireos. This is Philadelphia vireo. This is warbling vireo. Several species of warblers are just transients. They don't breed here. They're not here in the wintertime. Black pole warbler is one of them, as is golden-winged warbler and blue-winged warbler. And this is Tennessee warbler. Some more warblers, some beautiful warblers like Blackburnian warbler. This is what it looks like in the spring. This is one of those birds that becomes a confusing fall warbler and its fall plumage, its winter plumage essentially, it's not anywhere near as colorful as this. Same thing with chestnut-sided warbler. This is its breeding plumage. You'll see that in the spring. This is bay-breasted warbler, hooded warbler, Kentucky warbler, and Canada warbler, all transient warblers. Same thing with the beautiful cerulean warbler. Louisiana water thrush is mostly a transient, but a few will winter. Sometimes they find them in the Everglades or uh, even further north than that. This is a Swainson's warbler, which is a very secretive warbler that likes to poke around in leaf litter and probably the drabest of all of our warblers, but highly sought after because it's hard to find. This is a Connecticut warbler. Uh, they typically pass through in the spring in April and May, and sometimes they're reported during the fall in September and October. 
This is a morning warbler. Some people don't believe that this warbler actually exists, but they do. And I've never seen one in South Florida, but uh, those that have seen them uh, see them uh, during the spring in April and May, and then during the fall again in September and October. This is probably the, undoubtedly, the rarest warbler in North America. This is the Kirtland's warbler. Uh, they only nest in um, the Great Lakes area, mostly in Michigan, and then they winter in the Bahamas, mostly on the island of Eleuthera. But occasionally they will show up in spring and fall in South Florida. I've only seen this bird once in South Florida. Finally, beautiful birds like Scarlet Tanager are uh, here just in spring and fall. Uh, the uh, rose-breasted grosbeak is typically a transient, so though some may winter. Uh, same thing with blue grosbeak, um, typically a transient, but I've heard reports, since they, they tend to migrate in the spring as early as February, the ones that show up in February may be transients rather than actually winter visitors. This is a dick sisal, also a transient bird. This is a bobolink. Especially in the fall, they'll pass through in very large numbers. You just have to go to the right place to see them. Usually weedy fields is a good place to see this bird. And finally, this is orchard oriole, which is also a transient bird. Okay, let's talk about those resident species. Remember when I talked about turkey vultures, resident species whose population changed seasonally due to migration or post-breeding dispersal. You'll be amazed to find out that so many birds that we consider resident species, their populations actually increase. Most of them, their populations increase during the winter, a few during the summer, and then a few their populations change due to post-breeding dispersal. So the resident species whose population expands in the winter time, real quick, I'm going to go through these, wood ducks, pipebill grebes, uh, double-crested cormorant, and hingas, brown pelicans. All of the wading birds, so great blue heron, great egret, snowy egret, little blue heron, tricolored heron, cattle egret, reddish egret, green heron, black crown night heron, yellow crown night heron, white ibis and glossy ibis, black vulture and turkey vulture, osprey, bald eagles, cooper's hawks, red-shouldered hawks, um, short-tailed hawks, red-tailed hawks, clapper rails, king rails, purple gallinules, common gallinules, uh, Sandhill Cranes, Wilson's Plovers, Snowy Plovers, Killdeer, American Oyster Catchers, Laughing Gulls, Caspian Terns, uh, Royal Terns, Sandwich Terns, Black Skimmers, Morning Doves, uh, Barn Owls, Northern Flickers, Loggerhead Shrikes, uh, White-Eyed Vireos, Blue Jays, uh, American crows, fish crows, bluebirds, brown thrashers, our state bird, northern knock mockingbird, eastern towhees, Bachman sparrow, which uh, breeds in South Florida, but just barely, just at the uh, northern edge. But they, they're, um, they do move in the wintertime, as do uh, red-winged blackbirds and common grackles, and bronze cowbirds, and brown-headed cowbirds. All of these resident species, birds that we consider to live here year-round, not all of the individuals of these species live here year-round. For some individuals of these species, they're only here in the winter. For a few species, they're only here, some individuals of those species are only here during the summer. So uh, magnificent frigate birds, least bitterns, black neck stilts, white crown pigeons, mangrove cuckoo, and shiny cowbirds. 
their populations expand during the summer as more birds come typically from the Caribbean uh, or maybe Central or South America will come to South Florida to breed. And then there are a few birds that their movement during the course of the year is best explained by post-breeding dispersal. So Frovis whistling ducks, uh, after the breeding season, lots of juvenile uh, Frovis whistling ducks will actually uh, fly to Cuba and then they'll come back to Florida. Roseate spoonbills, their population will change in South Florida during the year due to post-breeding dispersal. Same thing with wood stork. Birds like um, burrowing owl and red-headed woodpecker, they've been found in the dry tortugas. And probably, I mean, they don't really migrate, so probably the best ex explanation for why they show up there is it's occurring due to post-breeding dispersal. Same thing with tufted titmouse. We don't think of tufted, tufted titmouse as a migrant, uh, but they do show up sometimes here in urban Miami-Dade. It's probably due to post-breeding dispersal. So you may be wondering, what does that leave? What's left in terms of resident species? Are there any resident species that don't change, their populations don't change seasonally due to migration? or post-breeding dispersal. So I added this slide to show you that yes, there are a few species that are here year round. Black-bellied whistling duck, mottle duck, northern bobwhite, wild turkey, um, mass booby, which is only found on Hospital Key in the dry tortugas, limkin, uh, white-tailed kite, snail kite. Now snail kites do wander, but they don't really migrate. Same thing with crested caracara. They sometimes show up in Miami-Dade County. They're not resident here. They're resident just in Collier, Lee County, Henry County, a little bit in Western Broward and Palm Beach counties, but they're not normally found in Miami-Dade. They will wander, but uh, it's probably, it may be post-breeding dispersal, who knows? Uh, this is common ground dove. Uh, this is eastern screech owl. This is uh, great horned owl, barred owl, uh, a red-bellied woodpecker, downy woodpecker, very small population of hairy woodpecker, a red cockaded woodpecker, which is found in Collier and Lee counties, a pileated woodpecker, um, Florida scrub jay, which used to be uh, found throughout Palm Beach County, uh, now just barely hanging on in northern Palm Beach County. They're also found in Lee County, uh, but they don't migrate. Um, Brown-headed nuthatch, uh, Carolina wren, northern cardinal, eastern meadowlark, and boat-tailed grackle. As far as I know, the species that are on the screen now they, their population really doesn't change. Now, I may learn something about some of these species at some point, and I might, sh might shift them off the screen to another screen. So we're always learning something new about the birds in South Florida. All right, so now to the second part of my presentation, I'll try to go through this very quickly. You may want to know why do these birds migrate? Why don't they just stay in one place? Well, birds migrate when they experience seasonal changes in resource availability. So birds that migrate leave areas of low or decreasing resources and move to areas of high or increasing resources. Those resources could include food, nesting locations, or even daylight. So this uh, American goldfinch, they don't nest in South Florida because the resources uh, for them, they just won't find them here. They have to go north to breed to find enough food for their babies, uh, nesting locations where they won't be competing maybe with other species, and most important, increased daylight in the northern areas where they breed. More daylight provides more opportunities for the parent birds to go out and find enough food for themselves and their babies. 
So what are the advantages of migration? Because migration can be a very dangerous thing. So there has to be some advantages to doing it. So for migrant birds that nest at higher latitudes, latitudes that are higher than South Florida, it provides them with less competition for nesting locations, abundant food sources, whether it be insects or plants, increased daylight hours, and these factors allow more young to be raised. So this hooded warbler doesn't breed in South Florida. Its uh, requirements, nesting requirements, are only apparently only found from north of Gainesville. They do breed in North Florida, and then they breed throughout uh, eastern, the eastern United States up to uh, as far north as New York and the lower Great Lakes. So that's where they can find the abundant food sources, uh, less competition for nesting locations, and the increased daylight hours that they need but they can't stay in the winter. So they leave in the winter because wintering at lower latitudes than when the, where they breed avoids the harsh winter weather where they may breed and also avoids competing with resident high latitude species for very scarce food sources. There's not much in the way of insects or um, berries in uh, places in the winter time where many of these migrant birds breed. So they have to come south in the winter time. So what triggers migration? How do they know when it's time to migrate? Well, it could be any combination of changes in day length, changes in uh, air temperature, changes in food supply, or it could be a genetic predisposition. These birds are just genetically wired so that there could be hormonal changes that tell them when it's time to start migrating. What time of day do birds migrate? A lot of people think that birds only migrate during the day. Uh, there are some birds that migrate during the day. They're referred to as diurnal migrants. And these include vultures, hawks, kites, and falcons. And they migrate during the day to take advantage of rising thermals. During the day, as the air temperature heats up, a hot air rises, and that helps the birds to uh, stay aloft and not expend as much energy in flapping their wings. Nighthawk swifts and swallows are also diurnal migrates, but they migrate during the, the day primarily to feed on insects that are only active during the day. Nocturnal migrants are those migrants that travel at night. Most ducks, most shorebirds, and most songbirds are nocturnal migrants. They travel at night, first to avoid predators like hawks, but also to take advantage of cooler temperatures at nighttime and calmer air. So how do these migrants navigate? Um, do they have GPS? What do they use to figure out which direction to go? Well, many birds use landmarks to figure out which way they're going. Could be coastlines, rivers, mountain ranges, and places that have mountain ranges. They can use wind direction. Birds can actually um, feel uh, uh, changes in barometric pressure, and that can help them to um, know which direction to go or which, which areas to avoid. If air pressure is getting very low, that's an indication of a storm and they want to avoid flying through a storm. So they can actually detect changes in barometric pressure. Migrant birds have also been found to have what are referred to as internal maps or internal compasses. So they'll use the sun or the stars as uh, compasses or maps or even uh, magnetic fields or uh, odors to help them find direction. So to, to, to determine direction, they have a compass that uses the sun. So that's for diurnal migrants. Uh, migrants that uh, migrate during uh, the nighttime have a compass that uses the stars. They'll use that magnetic field as a compass to determine location. They'll have maps that use magnetic fields 
or maps that are able to detect changes in odors where they're able to recognize an odor that is associated with the location that they're trying to migrate to. So birds have lots of tools in their toolbox to help them to navigate. How far do birds migrate? Well, if they're a short-term migrant, they may only cover a short distance. Or in the case of uh, birds that uh, breed up on mountaintops, they may move only from the higher elevations of the mountain to a lower elevation. So we, we don't have mountains, so I'm not going to give you an example of that kind of short distance migrant, but I'll give you the example of a short tail hawk. This is a um, permanent resident in South Florida, and the, and the Florida population of short tail hawk breeds primarily in central Florida. And then most of that population will come down to South Florida during the winter. So their migration is only a couple hundred miles each way. Other birds are considered to be medium distance migrants. They can cover distances to, that span from one to several states or provinces, but medium distant migrants typically don't leave North America. So American woodcock is an example of a medium distant migrant. It breeds in the Northeastern United States and it winters in the Southeastern United States but South Florida is as far south as they'll ever migrate. They won't go to Cuba or any of the other islands in the Caribbean or Mexico or Central or South America. They stay in North America. On the other hand, long distant migrants, they have ranges that extend from the United States and Canada in the summer all the way to Mexico and farther south in the winter. So black hole warbler is an example of a long distance migrant. They breed in the boreal forests of Canada and they, uh, their winter range is in South America. In the springtime, they'll uh, move from their wintering grounds in South America through Florida. So we'll see lots of black pole warblers in the spring. But then in the fall, we won't see very many of them because most black pole warblers will take a more direct route in the fall from the Northeastern United States directly over the Atlantic Ocean and they'll fly nonstop direct all the way to South America. So that's an amazing distance for a little bird like a black pole warbler. And there are some long distance migrants that actually uh, will, they're, they're, the distance that they fly is much farther than that. The Arctic Tern breeds up in the Arctic, as its name suggests, but they winter in the Antarctic, where it's summertime there in our, in our winter season. So uh, some long distance migrants will fly as far as halfway around the world uh, twice a year during their migration. Just amazing. A lot of birds will use very specific routes year after year after year to get from their breeding grounds to their wintering grounds and then back again uh, at, um, from their wintering grounds to their breeding grounds in the spring. So those specific routes that birds tend to use, we refer to as flyways. So they're generalized routes taken by migrating birds between their breeding and wintering habitats. So you can see in North America that there are four flyways. The Atlantic Flyway and the Mississippi Flyway both pass through Florida, but the Central Flyway and the Pacific Flyway, birds that use those flyways typically don't pass through Florida. So if we see a migrant bird that typically is a Central or Pacific Flyway bird, if we see it in Florida, it's probably a vagrant. It somehow got off course and ended up in Florida. It, that wasn't its plan to come here, but sometimes they do show up here. So all of these flyways connect different kinds of habitat. Breeding habitat for shorebirds and ducks up in the tundra. Boreal and temperate forests are breeding grounds 
for many songbirds, as are uh, grasslands and shrublands. Lots of shorebirds and gulls and terns use coastal beaches, salt marshes, and estuaries as their breeding grounds. Many birds like wading birds, including this roseate spoonbill, um, use freshwater swamps and marshes. And then in the winter time, uh, birds that uh, will breed in the tundra will come down to coastal beaches in the winter time here in Florida or to freshwater swamps. Or for songbirds, they may be flying as far as forest. So flyways connect all of these essential habitats for birds. That's not the only habitat that uh, can be found on flyways. Many birds, migrant birds, also need stopover habitat, places where they can rest and refuel uh, and then continue on their way, especially if there's bad weather that prevents them from continuing. They need a place where they can just rest and get more food so that they can uh, have enough fuel to continue their journey. So local parks, like our county parks, and even your backyard can be an essential habitat for a migrating bird. So that's why in just a few minutes, I'm going to talk about what you can do to make your, bar, your backyard a better stopover habitat for migrant birds. Migrant birds face many natural hazards. There's the physical strength of flying those long distances. There's bad weather that can make the birds uh, go off, off course or prevent them from continuing at all. And then there are predators that are, are looking for a meal themselves. And there are migrant hawks that follow migrant songbirds um, that are flying maybe late in the afternoon or early in the morning, and uh, many of those birds um, never make it to where they're going because of those predators. So these are all natural hazards that the birds have all evolved uh, ways of dealing with. But what they're having a more difficult time with are human-caused hazards of migration, like habitat loss. This is Miami Beach. There's very little habitat left for songbirds and even shorebirds on Miami Beach because it's become so developed. And that's the case all over for these migrant birds. Every year, they're losing more and more habitat. Non-native predators like outdoor cats kill millions and millions of migrant birds every year. As do buildings. Millions of birds collide every year with buildings or other tall structures. There's loss of food sources. These are horseshoe crabs. The eggs of horseshoe crabs are an important food source for many migrating shorebirds. And many uh, shorebirds have evolved their migration to be timed when, when horseshoe crabs come up on the beaches to lay their eggs and then those shorebirds will uh, rest and then refuel by eating the horseshoe crab eggs. But horseshoe crabs are becoming less common. They're used as bait, they're used in medical research. So the um, decrease in the horseshoe crab population is having a negative impact on the migrant birds that rely on horseshoe crabs. Uh, to make it all the way to where they're migrating. Pesticides, which are killing so many insects. So many birds depend on insects uh, as a food source, and pesticides are eliminating uh, many of those insects. So that's having a negative impact on birds. And illegal trapping. Unfortunately, there are people here in South Florida that uh, like to keep birds in cages. So people illegally trap birds like painted buntings uh, for the cage bird trade, and that's having a negative impact on migration and, and bird populations. Climate change, unfortunately, is also having a negative impact on migration because it's altering the timing of migration as birds try to adapt to seasonal shifts in food availability. 
So for many birds, they, they have evolved to arrive at their breeding grounds at the time when uh, trees and plants are just starting to leaf and uh, insects uh, are also timed for that leafing of, of trees and plants. So climate change is causing in some places plants to leaf earlier and in other places for plants to leaf later. So that's having an impact on insects and it's having an impact on migrant birds. If the migrant birds are not adapting to changes caused by climate change, um, their populations are going to start to decrease. So I'm sure many of you have been reading um, about how so many of our migrant birds have been in decline over the last few decades. So in the last 50 years, uh, we've lost many, many birds, populations of many birds. Since 1970, it's estimated that we've lost about 2.5 billion migratory birds. That's a 28% population loss in the last 50 years. For a species like the Baltimore Oriole, it's even worse. Two in five Baltimore Orioles have been lost since 1970. So the Baltimore Oriole population has decreased by 40% in the last 50 years. And it's due to habitat loss, and climate change and all of the other things that I just listed that are hazards for migrant birds. For eastern forest birds in general, 170 million eastern forest birds have been lost since 1970. That's a 17% population loss. Six in 10 wood thrushes, a 60% loss in wood thrushes since 1970. Grassland birds, for some even worse, 720 million have been lost since 1970. For eastern meadowlarks, 75% population decline overall in the eastern meadowlark population in North America. So many of these birds are in big, big trouble. So what can we do for these birds? Well, what government agencies are trying to do is there or what um, non-governmental agencies are trying to do is they're trying to protect bird habitat. And one of the ways to protect bird habitat is to declare it an important bird area, an IBA. So on this map, all the areas in green have been in, uh, declared important bird areas. So the Important Bird Area Program is a global program of a non-governmental agency called BirdLife International that partners with National Audubon Society in the United States. And what the IBAs do is they provide essential habitat for migrant birds, either for breeding or for wintering, or it could even be stopover habitat for migrating birds. So there are over 11,000 IBAs in 200 different countries. And in the United States, over 2,500 IBAs, totaling over uh, 370 million acres. Focusing a little more on South Florida, we have lots of important bird areas here. All of the important bird areas are highlighted in red. They could be federal properties like Everglades National Park or Big Cypress National Preserve. They could be national wildlife refuges like Waxahachie National Wildlife Refuge. They could be state properties like the South Florida Water Management District properties, including the stormwater treatment areas. They could be state forests or state parks like Cape Florida Billbag State, state Park. They could be wildlife and environmental areas or they could be wildlife and management areas. They could be county properties, county parks or county natural areas. Or they could even be private areas like Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, which is uh, owned by uh, the National Audubon Society. Or it could be properties that are owned by the Nature Conservancy. So all these areas have been declared important bird areas to try to protect that habitat for both migrant birds and for resident birds. Now, what can you do 
to try to create a more bird friendly community near where you live. What are some things that you can do to make a difference for migrating birds? Well, first, if you have a backyard, I strongly encourage you to plant native plants like this beauty berry. Natives provide birds with stopover food sources, including fruits, seeds, insects, and spiders. Landscape your backyard for birds. Use plenty of layers, including understory, ground cover, shrubs, and trees. Provide cover in your backyard. Leave snags for nesting places. Stack down tree limbs to create a brush pile for birds to hide in. Create or protect water sources in your yard. All birds need water to drink and bathe. Change the water at least two to three times a week, especially when mosquitoes are breeding. Reduce or eliminate the use of herbicides and pesticides in your backyard. Using fewer chemicals, using natural pesticides in your home will keep wildlife, pets, and people, your own family, healthier and safer. If you have a cat, please keep your cat inside. It's going to be better not only for the birds that that cat may kill, but it's also better for the cat itself. Indoor cats live much better, healthier, safer lives than cats that are allowed to roam outdoors. Prevent window collisions. Put up screens. Use window decals or close the drapes and blinds when not at home to prevent uh, birds from crashing into your own windows. Help the birds to stay on course. Bright lights disrupt and distract night migrating birds. So again, keep the blind cl blinds closed at night. Turn off lights you're not using to prevent birds from being attracted to lights inside your house. And finally, extend a bird safety net beyond your backyard. So contact your lot, local Audubon chapter, ours is Tropical Audubon Society, to learn about opportunities to create healthy habitat in parks, beaches, and other places in your community. Tropical Audubon Society is creating a demonstration garden on our property, the Doc Thomas House, to show people how to create a better backyard for birds. So you may want to check that out. Okay, to learn more about bird migration, uh, I'm providing you several re resources which I used to create this presentation, I use all the time. One of them is the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, they uh, have created the database eBird. They've created the uh, Merlin app to help identify birds. And they have an amazing amount of information about birds at their website, as does the American Bird Conservancy. If you wanna learn more about what to do to protect birds, migrant birds from outdoor cats, or what to do to make your house uh, safer in terms of birds crashing into windows. The American Bird Conservancy has lots of excellent information on exactly how to do that. National Audubon Society also has lots of excellent information about how to um, do things to uh, protect and help migrant birds as, to our, as does our own organization, Tropical Audubon Society. So these are the websites that uh, you can go to to, um, to get lots more information, much more than information that I've had an opportunity to share with you this evening. So I thank you very much for joining me on this presentation. And now I'll give it back to Anna to see if we have any questions. Thank you, Brian, for that excellent informative presentation. We have seven questions and we're running out of time. So I would like to try to get to every question. So if we'll go as quickly as possible so we can get them all uh, answered before we end the presentation. So from Eleanor, we have a question. We saw limpkins in South Miami this past year, but we've never seen them there before. Does the resident population migrate around South Florida? 
I think what's happening with Limkins is they're becoming more urbanized, kind of what happened with white ibis many years ago, that now you see white ibis in backyards and you never did before. I'm seeing Limkins in my backyard now, and I think it's probably associated with the introduction of a non-native species of apple snail. Apple snails are the primary food source for limkins as well as snail kites. And since the introduction of uh, this non-native uh, apple snail, the limkins love the non-native apple snails. And if they can find them in urban areas along canals, I live uh, uh, along a lake and I see them quite often along my lakes and I see them eating uh, exotic apple snails. So that's probably what's happening. It's not migration. It's probably just a range expansion into the urban areas because of that apple snail. Thank you, Brian. From Stacy, I have a question. I have noticed a pair of female ruby-throated hummingbirds that come to my property every year. Do the same birds return to the same locations every migration cycle? If so, what other species do this? Excellent question. And yes, some ruby-throated hummingbirds will, or hummingbirds in general, will come back to the same backyard every year. They use those tools in their toolbox to uh, imprint uh, the specific location where they know that they can find a reliable source of food. And it's possible that every year of their lives, they'll come back to the same backyard feeder. The other group of birds that are famous for coming back to the same place year after year uh, are flycatchers. So um, when we have vermilion flycatchers, which is a vagrant flycatcher from, um, the southwestern United States and throughout Mexico, Central and South America, they sometimes show up in South Florida. But then the next year they'll show up again, we assume it's the same bird, shows up in the exact same place. So flycatchers do that as well. Thank you, Brian. Next question is from Grant. Do we ever see American robins in Miami-Dade County or just further north? I've seen American robins in my own backyard. American robins have a special kind of uh, migration called eruptive migration, that they tend to migrate in search of food sources. So American robins don't always migrate as far south as South Florida every year. If food sources are plentiful, plentiful enough uh, up north, they just won't bother to come this far south. But if they're running out of food up north, then they'll start moving down south until they find enough food. So some years there could be lots of robins, other years not a single one. So that's called eruptive behavior. Thank you, Brian. Next question is from Javier. What does the black pole war warbler feed on when flying over the Atlantic to South America? Nothing. Uh, it has <laughs> to completely refuel and fatten up uh, prior to making that leap across the ocean. So it will just, you know, eat as much as it can, whether it be insects or uh, plant sources of food to build up its fat reserves because in that flight over the Atlantic, it's going to burn off all of those fat reserves and it's actually going to start to burn off muscle so when it's flying, it has to hope that it doesn't hit headwinds or um, bad weather because that's going to slow it down. And unfortunately, <laughs> not all of the birds that attempt to migrate over water actually make it. A lot of them run out of gas. Uh, you know, they burn up all their fat reserves and they burn up all their muscle and they end up falling down into the water and unfortunately becoming fish food. So it, they, they do get returned into the ecosystem, but uh, unfortunately they never make it to their intended destination. Thank you, Brian. The next question is from Ruthie. 
Which of the flyways were affected by the catastrophic fallout reported in the news last week? Okay, you may be referring to um, what happened in New Mexico, where they found um, lots of dead swallows and a few other species just dead on the ground. And at first they thought it may have to do with um, the wildfires that are taking place in the West. But then a closer look uh, determined that the probable cause of that uh, die-off was probably the weather. Uh, in the week before the die-off, uh, the weather in places like Colorado, uh, the, the temperature dropped uh, 50 to 60 degrees in a 24-hour period. They had snow. Um, so when that happens, when the weather changes that quickly, the insects disappear. So probably those birds simply couldn't find anything to eat. And eventually, just like the black pole warblers that try to migrate over the Atlantic, because they didn't have enough fat reserves, eventually they just succumbed to the situation and ended up dying. So that's probably what happened there. That's my understanding of, of what happened. Thank you, Brian. Uh, our next question is, other than beautyberry, what other native plants do you recommend? Oh, there are so many uh, good plants. Um, Tropical Audubon Society has a brochure. Is, and is it available yet? It is available. But, uh, and is it online yet? It's not online yet, but it will be soon. Okay, so Tropical Audubon Society has uh, a brochure that they've created that lists all the uh, beneficial native plants that you can plant in your backyard. So off the top of my head, I know firebush is an excellent plant for hummingbirds. Um, there are lots of plants and all of them are listed in that brochure. So I would suggest uh, getting your hands on that brochure and you'll have all the information you need. Our, ne our next question is uh, from Grant again. I was wondering if you could talk a little more about the cave swallows. All, are these bir the birds you can see in large numbers under the bridges? Did you say that they are resident year round now? Some of them seem to be resident year round. Um, cave swallows are a type of swallow that build their nests out of mud. So um, they'll build mud nests uh, bridges are a safe place for them to build their nest. Uh, they're out of the way of predators, out of the way of the wind, things like that, weather and you know, rain, things like that. So that's why they've probably, uh, once Caribbean cave swallows found bridges in South Florida be, to be a, a suitable place for nesting, uh, they told their friends and eventually cave swallows became uh, an annual nester here in Miami, uh, particularly specifically in Miami Day, and some of them have decided to stay all year. So we'll see if, if in the future more and more cave swallows are here all year. The population definitely decreases in the winter time, but there are still a few that stay for the whole year. Okay, Brian, I have two more questions that just came in and then I think we're going to wrap it up. From Carol, I have an okay. increasing I have an increasing population of scaly breasted munias. Are these a newly introduced species? Yes, they are. Scaly breasted munias are um, native to Southeast Asia and they were introduced probably um, people released, they kept them as pets and they were accidentally released and they find South Florida. Uh, they're perfectly happy to breed here. They have all the resources they need to breed here. So they're now becoming a, an established um, introduced species in Florida. Thank you, Brian. And I have one more question from Mark. What is the most wanted species in South Florida? Well, I mean, that's, that's kind of a subjective question. It depends on uh, you know, what, you, what you really want to see. If you really want to see a beautiful bird, then certainly the painted bunting 
is uh, among the most beautiful birds in South Florida. If you want to see a very rare bird, uh, there's probably nothing rarer than black or yellow rails. They're very secretive. They live in habitats that are not easy to get into. Uh, so the rare birds like that are, are very sought after by, by birders. Once they've seen everything else, that's usually all that's left. So to clarify, he meant what is your most wanted bird, oh, Brian? My most wanted bird. Okay. Um, believe it or not, I've seen every bird in my presentation, but there's only one bird in my presentation that I haven't seen in Florida, and that's red phalarope. And that's a bird that if I hope to see it, I either have to hope that one shows up on land, which they do occasionally, but more often you have to see them offshore. And I'm no good on boats anymore. So I don't know if I'll ever see a red phalarope. I'll be very lucky if, if I see one. And that's the case for all of the pelagic birds. Uh, some birders a couple of weeks ago saw long-tailed long Jaegers right off the coast in Miami, but they had to go out on a boat in uh, very choppy seas right after the, uh, the uh, tropical storm passed through. So I don't think I'll be doing that anymore. Uh, so I just have to hope I see those birds from land. So red phalarope is probably the bird I want to see most. Thank you so much, Brian. I hope you get to see that bird. You truly deserve it. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you everybody for joining us on our live webinar. We're going to play one more slide. If you would like to keep in touch with us, please do. Brian's going to go to the next slide that has all of our social media handles and our website. Should be there now. We're there now. Thank you very much and uh, keep in touch. We'll let you know when our next webinar is and we will also be sending out a link with a um, recording of this webinar in the next few days to all registrants. Good evening. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, everyone.